Good morning. I would encourage you all to take a Bible and follow along. We'll be in Philippians chapter 2. Our whole study this morning will be out of Philippians, so it should be pretty easy to follow along. I do encourage you to take a Bible and join along with us. I want to extend my, my thanks. My thanks for all the members being out this morning to come together and to worship our God and our Savior. It's good to see all of you out. I'd like to thank the elders for the opportunity to uh, present God's Word to you this morning. It is something I enjoy doing every opportunity I have to present God's Word. If you would look at the duty roster out front, you might not find out when I was going to be speaking. Uh, I uh, was moved around two or three times. If you check the list outside, I've crossed off a handful of times. It's a joke that Ryan and I talked about a couple times. But uh, nonetheless, I am very excited and, uh, and thankful that I have this opportunity. This morning, I would like to talk to you uh, about attitude. Our key verse this morning is found in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Having a mind or having an attitude on things is very important. Our attitude and our outlook on life can affect every part of our life. It can affect our demeanor. It can affect our decisions. It can affect our relationships with uh, perhaps our employer, with our families. It is the driving force with everything that we do. It's important to have a good attitude when you are presented with different trials in life, as we'll see, uh, as Jesus did here. Before I get to talking too much about attitude, I want to introduce this, an idea that I had that was kind of a uh, idea for this lesson, and it's the idea, uh, it's not talked about very much, it's not uh, very well known, some of you may have heard it before, it's known by a couple different names, uh, the most popular names are the Law of Attraction, or sometimes known as the secret. And this idea is that you can literally think things into existence. That say if I wanted a particular car, if I focused very hard on what type of car I wanted, the year and the make, the model and the color, what size I wanted, that one day that that car would just kind of appear in my driveway. Yes, you can go ahead and laugh, you can go ahead and chuckle, but this idea is out there. Now, I'm not saying that we can think things into existence. I'm not saying that we can just uh, think about cars or money or even a house and that's just going to appear. But this idea about thinking or having a mindset isn't too far-fetched. And that's what I'd like to talk to you about this morning. But before we get too far into that, we'll come back to the Law of Attraction. You're in the book of Philippians. Let's start in chapter 1 and in verse 27. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, and that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them proof of perdition, but to you of salvation, and that from God. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also suffer for his sake having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here is in me. Chapter 2. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, any comfort in love, any fellowship of spirit, any affliction and mercy, fulfill my joy of being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each of you esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not for not only for his own interest, but also the interest of others. Now, if you were here at the beginning of the month, uh, Alan did an excellent job uh, covering these last couple of verses here that we read in the beginning of chapter 2 about our mindset or our attitude towards others. And I won't repeat his entire sermon. I encourage you to go back and listen to it if you are not here. But that attitude that we have for others or in serving others. I was part of a study one time and the word that we used was selflessness opposed to selfishness, thinking of yourself last and others first. And in doing so, knowing that not only others' needs will be fulfilled, but others in the same way will have your needs fulfilled if we have this attitude. 
And also, uh, it comes out in uh, verse 27 of chapter 1. Conduct yourself worthy of the gospel of Christ. And towards the end, that I may hear of your affairs, that you should stand fast in one spirit and one mind. You see, our attitude is very important when it comes to serving the Lord. And what is our attitude? What is our attitude in obedience? Whether it be things when it comes to work, things we're told to do by somebody else, our employer, our parents maybe, or other family members. What is our attitude when it comes to obedience? Philippians chapter 2, let's start in verse 5. Let this mind be in you which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal to God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death of the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, those in heaven and those on the earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my brethren, just as you as you've always obeyed, not only my presence only, but much more my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining or disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God, without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights to the world, holding fast the word of life, so I may rejoice in the day of Christ, and I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason, you are also, also be glad and rejoice with me. So here we see the perfect example of obedience. As Jesus is the perfect example of many things, that he was obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And that he had the proper attitude when it came to this. I believe that when Jesus was in this life, that every step that he took, every decision that he made, every thought that he had was for the intent of our salvation. He had that mind with him the entire time. And having that mind, having that attitude, he was able to endure affliction. He was able to endure sin. He was able to suffer the cross. And then in uh, verse 12, we see that we should have this attitude in what? In our own salvation. We should work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. What is our attitude when it comes to salvation? Is it just Sunday morning and sometimes Wednesday night? Is it maybe I'll study the Bible in the middle of the week? Or maybe I might get my lesson done? If we had the attitude and shared in the mind of Christ, as it says here, what would our attitude be towards salvation? How would that change our outlook on life? How would that change our relationship with others? It was told to me once that sometimes when you are lost and you don't know how to perceive things or the world is attacking you, you should remember that every person you come in contact is another soul. And that soul you want to join you in heaven. That attitude and that mindset would definitely change our outlook in life. Another verse I wanted to bring out here, sometimes it's overlooked in this context, it popped out to me not too long ago when I was reading it, is verse 14. Do all things without complaining or disputing. Another version says it like this. Do everything readily and cheerfully, no bickering, no second guessing allowed. How many of us in here complain? Some of you are familiar, uh, I work at AutoZone, which is a retail environment. Anybody else who's familiar with a retail environment is probably also familiar with the customer on the other side of the counter. And sometimes it's easy to bicker and easy to complain and, do, and grumble about different things. Uh, I could probably fill the rest of the day talking about customers I've had. I'm sure if you've been in retail, you can do the same. But what is our attitude towards them? And how does our attitude, how we approach that person, that customer, that family member, that brother and sister in Christ, how does that attitude come forth in our character and our demeanor? Next, turn over to Philippians in chapter 4, and we'll be starting in verse 4. Brother Rick read this on Wednesday night, 
and he's not with us this morning. He said he would be in Tucson. But I told him that I'd just continue the thought for him. In Philippians chapter 4 and starting verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And the things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly now. At last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not, excuse me, not that I speak in regard to need. For I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I have learned to both be full and be hungry. And both to abound and suffer many need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So here we can see the attitude of Christ, or the, excuse me, the attitude of Paul when he's going through sufferings. So you see, this, this idea of the law of attraction, or the secret, was really no secret to Paul. He knew these things. He knew that if he focused on the good, pure, holy, just things, that that's where his attitude would be. How do you think Paul was able to suffer these afflictions to be abased and to abound and to be hungry and to be full. Do you think Paul, when, when he was full, was rejoicing and was praising God and was thankful, but when he was hungry that he was embittered towards the merchants or that he, he uh, thought ill of those who had food when he didn't? Of course not. Do you think Paul, when, when he was abounding or that he had uh, support from the churches around him, that he was thankful to God for that? But when he didn't have enough money and he had to go back to be a tent worker, do you think he was complaining about being a tent worker? Of course not. He had this attitude that we see here, that you focus on the good things in life. And what if we had this, this attitude? What if we did these things? Very clearly, in, uh, verse uh, 9. We have many teachers in the room. Uh, and... There's different ways that students learn. Anybody who's taught are familiar with the different ways that students learn. But in verse 9, Let these things which you have learned, received, heard, and saw in me, these do. What form of teaching isn't covered there? If we focused on doing these things that Paul's presented to us and having the attitude of Christ, our attitude toward salvation, our attitude towards our brothers and sisters would change. And even our daily perception and our daily life. What is your attitude in your daily life as you go to and fro, when you go back and forth to work? Is it trying? Sometimes it's very trying. In my life right now, I'm kind of in the middle. I'm not necessarily an adult, depending on who you ask. I'm not necessarily a kid, depending on who you ask. I don't have really a very good foundation as of right now, but I'm, I'm learning, I'm growing. But sometimes it's very easy to be caught up in this in-between and this unknown. And many of us, I'm sure, have probably been there sometimes where you just don't know what's going on and you don't know what attitude you should have and you just feel at a loss. Turn over to Philippians in chapter 3. And Paul, once again, will reveal an attitude that we should have in our daily lives. Chapter 3, and starting in verse 7. But the things that were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, from whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I might gain Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but, which is but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I might know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I might attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained it, or am already perfected, but I press on, that I might lay hold, which Christ Jesus also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself as apprehended, 
But one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind and reaching forward to the things that are ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us many are mature have this mind. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk in the same rule and of the same mind. So here we can see very clearly the attitude that Paul has in his daily life. He counts all things for rubbish for what? The knowledge of Christ Jesus. You could stop right there. That's a whole lesson in itself. I think I may have even heard a lesson like that before. The knowledge, not even the death, the resurrection, the promises that God gave. Paul was willing to count all things for lost even for the knowledge of Christ. But what do we have today? We have everything. Everything, all the blessings found in Christ. And the attitude that he presents in verse 13. Many of us have heard before, but it's worth repeating. One thing I do, count myself, I do not count myself as apprehend, but one thing I do, forgetting which the things that are behind and reaching forward to the things that are ahead. How many of us have things in our past that we don't like? How many of us have sins that haunt us? How many of us have regrets from our past life? I tell you, if you are in Christ, they mean absolutely nothing. And you should not let them haunt you. What if Paul had that attitude? What was Paul? What did he call himself? The chief sinner. He put men to death. He dragged men out of their homes to be put to death and offer them before city councils. What do you think Paul... Paul's attitude would be if he let these things haunt him. If he let these things affect his attitude. Do you think he would be the example that he is for us today? Certainly not. I put the same thing to you. If you have things in your past that you've done that you regret, you regret or if you have sins that haunt you, I encourage you to do the same attitude as Paul here. Forgetting the things that lie behind and reaching forward to the things that lie ahead knowing that in Christ every step forward, every thought you have from here going on is new. And nothing in the past has to affect you. And what a blessing that is. And finally, brethren, let's close up chapter 3, starting in verse 17. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us as a pattern. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you, we, even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working of which he is even able to subdue all things to himself. Therefore, my beloved and long-for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. So here we can see Paul giving the example of exactly what we were talking about before, those who are living in the past or having their mind set on earthly things. We know their end. Their end is destruction. But what about for us? What is our attitude? Our citizenship is in heaven. I think sometimes it's very easy to forget that. That we are chosen people of God. We are called out of this world. And that if you are a faithful Christian, that your name is in the book of life. And your attitude and your conduct should reflect that. So what is your attitude this morning? Do you have the proper attitude in obedience? Do you have the proper attitude when it comes to others and relationships in your family? Do you have the proper attitude on your outlook in life knowing that you are chosen and a child of God looking upward towards the call of Christ Jesus? Is your citizenship in heaven or are you focused on earthly things? If you have not come to know Jesus, 
We do hope that you have studied and you know the proper things to do to be a child of God. Because all the things that were presented this morning are lost if you are not part of his family. But you have that opportunity to come forward to put your sins in the past, to put your old life behind you, and to have every step and every thought anew from this point going forward. Or if you are a Christian this morning, and if you have stumbled one side or another, there is no shame in that. I don't believe there is a person in here who will not say who have not been caught up with the temptations and cares of this life. But more important that you get back on the right track and start following His will. If you need to come forward and confess to be a child of God, or you need help in any way from this membership, we ask you to come forward as we stand and as we sing.